as we know, that all climate change debate really has to start with the science, because um, um, without which there is nothing, nothing will happen, nothing can happen nowadays. We're going to start with Miles. Miles is going to give us a rundown on the situation as it is, but not from the point of view of doom and gloom and how awful this is. We kind of know that. We need to, we, of course, we do need to know the reality. We need to know that the grapes are not going to grow and the, and the rice isn't going to grow. And, 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 but we also need to know is how we're going to get out of this mess. So Miles is going to talk to us a lot about mitigation as well. So Miles, over to you, please. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for that introduction, John. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll take that, that, that challenge. Do, do I have some, uh, can I have the clicker, by the way, because I think that's my PowerPoint I'm hoping will, will appear. Um, yeah, here we are. Uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd kick off with um, this big question. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm British and I talk too fast. And so if I start talking too fast, wave both hands above your head or something, and I will try and remember to slow down. Um, apologies in advance uh, if I, if I, if I over, overdo it. Because um, I get excited about this stuff, because it's important. Um, and this is the big question that a lot of people have been asking me ever since the Paris Agreement was, uh, w was agreed. Um, within minutes, people were phoning, people like John, were phoning me up saying, one and a half degrees, that's ridiculous. That's impossible, isn't it? Tell me it's impossible so I can write a headline, climate scientist says diplomats made a mistake. Um, and I didn't help then and I'm not helping now because actually the answer is yes. We can achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Many, I think, find this still quite surprising. Uh, indeed, many journalists, when the 1.5 degree report was leaked a few weeks ago, um, there were a lot of headlines, particularly in Germany. They seem to be very keen to be gloomy in Germany, particularly in January. I guess it's kind of a gloomy month. Um, and uh, there was a lot of reporting basically saying the IPCC admits that Paris was just a big mistake and it's impossible, we can't do it. Um, yes, we can do it. Um, so that's wrong, but there is a but, I'm afraid. Um, and let me explain to you what achieving the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement actually means. Um, I should stress, I should have said this right at the beginning, I'm speaking to you as an individual climate scientist. I have an IPCC vice chair with his beady eyes on me, so I need to emphasize that even though I am involved in the 1.5 degrees report, nothing I say uh, is anything to do with that report. I'm just talking to you as an individual researcher here. Um, but of course, I, I have been involved and I'm a, a very a long-standing um, supporter of the IPCC process, both as a scientist contributing results to the process and as an author assessing other scientists' work. So the but here is this. Um, the answer, this is a very, this is where I start to sound like a university professor. Well, the answer depends on your interpretation of the question. Okay, but unfortunately in this case it is true, although that does sound like a rather boring thing to say. In particular, it depends on, the, these are the two critical articles of the Paris Agreement. Um, holding the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees, above pre-industrial. And then Article 4 about achieving this through achieving a balance between sources and sinks of greenhouse gases in the second half of this century. The critical questions are, what do we mean by global average temperature? What do we mean by pre-industrial? And what do we mean by balance? In fact, Jan Vuglesvet, who you heard from this morning, has just written a paper on this whole question of what is, how do we understand this balance between sources and sinks in the second half of this century? If you use the interpretations, global average temperature, everybody talks about it, but you've got to understand it's actually quite a hard thing to measure. And different groups, different ways of measuring it actually make quite a big difference to the outcome. If the Arctic is at 20 degrees warmer than it should be right now, then the amount of weight we give to the Arctic in our measure of global temperature makes a big difference to the level of warming we've got to. But if we use the definitions of warming that were used in the build-up to the Paris Agreement, 
then we are now at about one degree above pre-industrial. Inevitably, there are scientists out there, because we are scientists and we like to argue, who are arguing, actually, pre-industrial was colder than that, so actually we're more like 1.3 degrees. That's not an argument I want to enter into now, because it doesn't really matter. At the time of the Paris Agreement, we had a, a, an understanding of what pre-industrial was. Late 19th century temperatures was what they used. And on that measure, we are now at one degree above pre-industrial, and we are warming at about two-tenths of a degree per decade. At that rate, I'm not sharing any confidential IPCC science with you if I point out that that means we have about 22 years to reach 1.5 degrees. The reason I'm not sharing anything confidential with you is that's just obvious. If we've got half a degree to go and we're warming at two-tenths of a degree per decade, we've got that sort of time when you take the rounding into account before we actually get to one and a half degrees. That's just maths. It's not science. Mathematicians might object to my making that distinction, but you know what I mean. Okay, so, so at, the, at the present rate of warming, um, we would, it will be reaching 1.5 degrees in uh, 20 or so years' time, 20 to 25 years' time. Or you can put this another way. We've got about double that time, 40 to 45 years, to achieve greenhouse gas balance. And by balance there, I mean net zero carbon dioxide emissions. That means for every ton of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere at that time, another ton has to be taken out again actively by human activity. That's what net zero means. So balance means net zero carbon dioxide emissions. And it also requires that we have no further warming, we control other sources of greenhouse gases such that they cause no further warming after that time. If we can do that, over the next 45 years, we have a good chance, as you can see here, the orange line smoothly straightens out and goes level at the time we reach 1.5 degrees. So 45 years. That's less than my lifetime, I have to confess. Perhaps double the lifetime of several people in this room, but not very long. To go from a global energy economy that's still 86% dominated by fossil energy, that number has barely changed over the past 20 years, despite all the progress we've made in renewable energy. We have to go from there to zero in a generation. And this is why, for the young people in this room, this is the generation, this 45 years, which is going to define our climate outcome. And that's where we need some, to make some big decisions and where the, the, the challenge really comes out, becomes clear. If we look at the scenarios that actually meet the Paris goal, if we look at what happens to emissions, you can see on the left here carbon dioxide emissions going down amazingly quickly. Look at, look at how in some of those scenarios, you have flat emissions to 2030, and then suddenly, in the space of five or 10 years, emissions go down by a factor of three. Okay, that's in the 2030s, 2040s. That's not very far away. These are the scenarios that actually meet the Paris goal. In other scenarios, we have faster reductions immediately and not such dramatic reductions later on. That's a very important payoff. If we start reductions now, it makes a big difference to how fast we have to reduce emissions in the future to meet the same temperature goal. This is a simple consequence of the fact that carbon dioxide accumulates in the climate system. Every ton you put into the atmosphere is a ton you can't put into the atmosphere. Every ton of carbon dioxide that I put into the atmosphere is a ton that you can't, and I'm pointing at the young people in the room. That's a good way of thinking of it, yeah? So if we, if we don't start reducing emissions now, then we have to reduce emissions very dramatically 
um, in the 2030s, 2040s, if we're still to meet our climate goals. But if we were to start reducing emissions now and reduce them to zero over the next 45 years, we'd have a very good chance of meeting the long-term goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. I've realized I haven't really been keeping track of how long I've been talking. Okay, good, good. okay. The other thing I want to sh point out to you about these figures is those blue lines go below zero. So in all of the scenarios where we meet the long-term goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, we are actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the second half of this century. And that's really important because you heard this morning many people talking about things we can do about climate change, ways to reduce emissions by substituting renewables for fossil, for example, by using energy more efficiently and so on. But I didn't hear this one talked about. And this capacity to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to be in my view, and I stress here, I'm speaking as an individual climate scientist, is going to be the critical determinant, the critical question that determines whether we can meet our long-term temperature goals. But if we do manage to develop a capacity for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and get emissions down in the short term, then we do still have a very good chance of meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. So don't let anybody tell you that it's already hopeless. Many journalists seem to like saying it's already hopeless. I don't know why. Maybe it's very, it must be a very gloomy profession because you all love doom. We, so, we just like you, Miles. We like winding you up. A bit. Okay. Oh, well, that's it. So, so this is the challenge of achieving the 1.5 degree goal. This is a, a, an, an analogy of the challenge. No, actually, no, it's just like this. This is a typical climate conference. Okay, so we have demand reduction on the one hand, reducing emissions in the short term, we have carbon dioxide removal in the, the longer term challenge of taking carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. And scientists, I, mean, I, I talk a lot about the need for carbon dioxide removal, partly because I don't feel people talk about it enough. Lots of people talk about the need for demand reduction. Um, and there's, you know, we are you know, typical scientists fighting a little bit with each other about which is more important. Um, but they both will be essential in determining the 1.5, whether we achieve the 1.5 degree goal. And finally, of course, in the context of this session in particular, we have the need for sustainable development. If we try and reduce demand by 60% in 10 years, which is what some of those scenarios do, that will, I have absolutely no doubt, have an impact on sustainable development and a negative impact. So we can't do that that fast. Some environmentalists would argue with that, but that would be my view, and that's what comes out of most of the scenarios. So we have to find a balance between these three, and those are my conclusions. We can stabilize, um, we, we can stabilize temperatures at 1.5 degrees, and the current level of warming and the rate of warming determines how much time we have to do so. And the answer is about a generation, 45 years. So, if we're going to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, hopefully, my, my father's reasonably elderly and seems to be in good health, so based on my genes, I have some chance of finding out whether we will succeed in meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, but basically in my lifetime we have to achieve net zero, which is a big challenge because I'm already over 50. Miles, thank you very much. Leave it, okay, leave it, leave okay, I've, got, I've, got, I've got three more clicks. You told me I had loads of time just now. Let me cl click. Keep going. Okay. They, be they better be good. Okay, well. they'll be great clicks. <laughs> so, so the options are um, either these traumatic near-term demand reduction measures, which would compromise near-term sustainable development, or a commitment to massive CO2 removal, which would compromise sustainable development again, but later in the century, when we have to devote all our resources to taking CO2 out of the atmosphere instead of growing food crops, um, or both. And this, of course, is what we actually will need if we're going to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement without, um, with, without uh, uh, compromising uh, our need for sustainable development. And I just want to end with a personal challenge to the young people in this room, particularly the students in the University of Bologna. We know how to reduce emissions in the short term. We don't know how to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The technology exists, 
but the costs and the side effects are still unknown, and there are no effective policy instruments for making it doing it. And the crucial thing you should ask yourselves when you see those diagrams that have emissions going below zero in the second half of this century, the question you should be asking yourself is, who's going to pay for that? Because the people sitting here aren't. You're going to be paying for it. And that's the question we need to be focusing on. How on earth is that going to happen without um, us essentially bailing out the fossil fuel industry in a few decades' time by having to take all that CO2 back out of the atmosphere um, in order to, uh, uh, to compensate for the CO2 that this generation has put in? That's a challenge for you to think about. Wow. <laughs> You can see why his students are rebelling, can't you? <laughs> no, uh, thank you very much, Martha. It's really good. Can I just, ask, on a sort of personal level, stop, you know, take off your hat as the, as the professor of, 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 of climate at Oxford. Um, are you optimistic, or are you actually, underneath this cheery exterior, a sort of really gloomy German? No, I, I'm, at, I'm fundamentally optimistic because I work in a university, and I deal with people like the Oxford Climate Society, who actually have ideas and, and creative solutions to the future. I, I think we could absolutely solve this problem. The problem is we haven't yet worked, and, and we have the technologies to solve the problem. We, we know what we need to do. What we haven't yet worked out is how to solve the collective action problem of working out who's going to do it and how. Have you worked out the problem of Mr. Trump? I, I think that's... It, it, no, I mean, tr Trump goes beyond climate, so let's, let's not. But, but I think the, the issue with Trump, and indeed many parties, uh, politi politicians in the UK as well, we can't just blame the Americans on this, and, and, and I believe in, in Italy as well, there's plenty of politicians who still want to argue that there's no such thing as climate change. Um, I, I think we need more creative solutions which are compatible with their worldviews. So I think the difficulty we have in the European Union in particular is that the European Commission gives the, everybody the impression that if they want to take climate change seriously, they have to do it the European Commission's way. And if they don't like the European Commission, then people are sort of boxed into a corner of not being able to take climate change seriously. I think we need a, a greater variety of solutions to climate change which are palatable to a broader spectrum of political opinion. Great, let's go on to those ones in, in, in a minute. Um, so Jane, can I, can I ask you, I mean, you're, you're a man who's been really working out the policies. When, when someone like Miles comes to you and he says, right, okay, it's all gonna go belly up uh, in, in a generation unless we do, do you just say, oh, well, I'll well, leave it to the next government? Or how do you respond to something as serious and as existential and as fundamental as someone with the best knowledge in the world saying, unless we do something immediately, it's all going to go very, very wrong. I mean, you must be panic-stricken as a policymaker. Okay, well, thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say first that I did make it actually from Rome this morning. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure if I'll be able to go back, but I did make it despite the snow. Well done. Um, no, thanks, thanks for the question, and, and, and thanks, Miles, for, for the um, very useful introduction to the topic. If Miles were to come to me and ask the question, as you said, um, I would agree with him to the fact that we are running out of time, and whatever we're doing now, we're not doing enough, and we're not doing it fast enough. So if you put all the contributions at the moment from all the countries around the world and this is what they refer to in the negotiations that na as the nationally uh, determined contributions. If you put all those together, they are not enough to take us to the degree C objectives. In fact, they only take us third of the way towards that. Mm. So my answer would be, yes, there is um, an urgency for us actually to take action. Not just governments, by the way, but everyone. The sad aspect of this is that actually we don't actually realize how serious this is. We really don't. I think ordinary people are really disconnected from this. They see floods here, drought there, but we don't realize that actually if we don't do something in the next two years, the window of two years that we have, 
to raise our ambition, to take this seriously, we are going to be in trouble. And the, the graphs you showed there, even if we were to stop now, today, all the emissions, we'll still see the impact happening. So that's why all the countries actually have to think seriously about this, put policies in place, and lots of countries are doing. The only problem is we're not doing enough. And I think this is where we all have to feel the sense of responsibility, not just governments. And by the way, for the US, what non-state actors are doing in the US is really impressive. So what the Trump administration says is completely different to what the states are doing because they're still in, in the climate change agenda. And I, that, that's it's really good. So that would be my answer. Um, and when, when you were working with the British government, I know now you're with the world, uh, with the UN system, did you, did you find that the politicians there were listening or did you find that it was a deep resistance? I mean, I only say that because even at The Guardian, I say even at The Guardian, 20 years ago, it was very, very difficult to persuade people that uh, climate change was happening. And even when the science was put on their plate, there were people, uh, in, in very, very intelligent, educated people who did not want to understand the scale of what was going to happen or what was happening. And uh, it was very sad. And I'm just wondering whether in the British government, and therefore with the European Union and other, is there still this very, very deep reluctance to actually accept that we are in a very big mess? Well, politicians are listening, at least because um, the evidence that comes from organizations like the IPCC is very compelling, is very convincing, and um, you have to translate it in a way that convinces policymakers of the fact that you have to do something about it. And I think because of that, we've seen a lot of things happening, like on renewable energy, for instance, and a lot of other initiatives that, that are taking place. I think in a sense, we, we had and we still have no choice but to take this seriously. And it was interesting this morning about the discussion about communication. I think that's where we're still failing because we are not really getting the message to people so they can be actually scared about it. Uh, to find the balance between making them scared and making them also realize that there are co-benefits in tackling climate change. And given the topic of, of this meeting, the climate action is needed if we want to move towards sustainable development. There is no way that we can have a uh, sustainable economic or environmental development without dealing with the issue of climate change because climate change, it affects almost every sustainable development goals, water, health, education, etc. So they're so interlinked, the climate change is moving fast, but we're not. And that's why it's going to affect everything uh, on the sustainable development scale. Can, can you just, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you were going to, you know, you've written lots of wonderful notes, but I'm, I'm sort of absolutely intrigued because the more I look into what's happening with agriculture and climate, the more uh, worried I get. And it's things like the rice production, which is a third or more, more than a third of all the world's food. If the temperatures rise just one, one and a half degrees, then basically the rice crop is a very, very vulnerable. What, what sort of things is the FAO, so the UN? Are you taking this seriously? I mean, you, is, is the message getting through to everybody there? You're in the front line of developing countries coming to you saying, we are in trouble. Are you, are you getting enough uh, action, you think? Yes, of course, we are taking it seriously and we're getting a lot of action. And in fact, climate change is not going to affect just rice production. It affects agriculture in general. It affects food, food prices. Uh, when there are droughts, when there are floods, they affect um, food supply. Uh, the cost of food increases. And then you have other social and economic impact as well. So what we do with countries is to make them actually prepare and to have policies that help them to have resilience systems to be able to cope with, with, with these impacts and to see the reality of, of the connections between all these, these parameters. Because I think that's something really to underline, you know, we can't talk about climate change in isolation. It's so interconnected with other things. For example, conflicts, you know, linked partly to climate change, but conflicts also lead to 
um, problems with food security and with uh, poverty. So what we do with the countries is to to make sh to, to help them actually put policies in place that can address these issues to get them also to benefit from tools that can allow them to assess the impact and plan ahead and especially put actually policies that have a long-term view. And, and this is where we also need the evidence. It's critically important when you sit in with the ministers and try to get them actually to do something about issues, then you have to be convincing. So you have to give them the evidence that is robust, that is trusted, and to say, you know, you need to do this because these are the benefits. This is not just about climate change. Do you think there's enough evidence, for instance, that the Syrian conflict started with droughts and climate change? Is, is there any uh, good enough evidence to, to support that theory? I wouldn't say it started only because of that. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely contributed. Um, I think climate change is an enabler. Uh, it does actually accelerate certain factors. But there isn't a clear cut to say that that was just due to climate change. But climate change is part of the equation, uh, and it does have so many other effects. And uh, lastly, before we go on to, uh, on to, on to uh, air and everything, um, are you seeing really optimistic things as well? I'll tell, I, again, I say why is that I did some research just a few weeks ago on the amount of trees which are being planted and the scale of the tree planting efforts which countries signed up to at Paris and now are beginning to do. And so you're seeing a vast uh, new wave of, 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 of tree planting. And it's mostly, it's very, very positive. It's not about palm trees. It is actually a sort of genuine uh, desire to, to increase the, the uh, tree cover and therefore the sink potential. We'll, we'll come on to that. Are you seeing other optimistic signs? Are you really, is there something you go home at night thinking, oh yes, we might get there? Yes, I am optimistic, but pessimistic at the same time. And I'll explain briefly why. I am optimistic because we do have the technology, at least, that can actually allow us and help us address these issues. And we can see we have technological revolution at the moment, and we have to harness the power of technology for agriculture and for a lot of other sectors as well. It's going to help us to get through. I'm pessimistic because as I said earlier, the message is really not getting to people. We're not doing enough, all of us. We take so many things for granted. We, we waste a lot of energy, we waste a lot of water, we waste a lot of food. It doesn't make sense that the third of the food we produce is wasted, and yet there are over 800 million people who don't have enough food. There are in fact more obese people in the planet than malnourished people. So we all have responsibility really to do something, as, you know, even if it's a small thing. And by the way, I just say one final thing as a message, since we were talking about uh, plastic this morning. And plastic does have a big impact on the ocean, on, on, on the animals, and it all comes back to us to affect our health. By the way, straws. Nobody needs straws. So if you go and have a drink, particularly students, all of us, if you go and have a drink, Please refuse straws. Nobody needs them because they end up in the ocean, they kill the animals, and also they pollute the ocean. Well, that's the first really practical <laughs> solution we come up to today. So, no more straws. If I see a straw, we are going to be chucked out. <laughs> and, uh, um, okay, um, thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, um, Sophie Stellini, give her a big hand. Sophie, thank, thank, thank you for, 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 for you've, heard, you've heard the science, you've heard the policymaker. As a member of the public, as a, you know, down on the grassroots, what do you think about what's, what's going on and what should be going on and where are we missing the point? Okay, thank you very much. Um, someone says that French doesn't speak English and it's true. <laughs> No, it's not true, but I would like to speak in Italian here. So uh, I beg your pardon, but I will continue in Italian. Um, uh, io qui rappresento ANTER, Associazione Nazionale a Tutela delle Energie Rinnovabili. E eh, l'associazione è un'associazione fatta essenzialmente di, di cittadini. La missione di Anter è una missione per lo più educativa e didattica, 
e è quindi estremamente attiva nelle scuole in Italia. Eh, Quest'anno eh, Anter ha deciso di eh, investire ancora di più eh, nella comunicazione, come si diceva stamattina bisogna creare dei ponti tra scienza e cittadini e questa è la missione che ci stiamo prefiggendo per quest'anno. Ehm, così abbiamo creato un comitato scientifico, eh, quindi con delle pubblicazioni essenzialmente svolte da eh, scienziati italiani del Centro Polari San Milano ma anche dell'Università di Cassino. Eh, ma anche internazionali, in particolare la Queensland University in Australia eh, che collabora con noi. La nostra attenzione è quella di trasferire eh, i dati della comunità scientifica ai cittadini, cittadini intesi non solo come eh, ragazzi nelle scuole, ma cittadini intesi anche come eh, adulti che non sempre hanno la consapevolezza di questa velocità di cui parlava eh, il collega Situni ehm, riguardo al cambiamento climatico. Le cose stanno andando velocemente e abbiamo il dovere di reagire velocemente, quindi eh, in questo ambito Anter è un po' il ponte tra le istituzioni, la comunità scientifica e il cittadino e quest'anno organizzeremo un tour in tutta Italia, ovviamente accessibile a tutti. Thank, th thank you. I, I'm going to have to ask you in, in English. I'm sorry. Um, do you need the media or can you just bypass that completely? Do you need the media? Do you need yes, newspapers? We, um, sì, eh, sicuramente abbiamo bisogno dei media perché eh, ovviamente l'associazione ha eh, un sito internet, ha ovviamente dei eh, social, è attiva. Eh, ma abbiamo assolutamente bisogno dei media. Eh, quando faremo il nostro tour abbiamo chiesto ovviamente a giornalisti economici di partecipare in modo da eh, illustrare quanto la sostenibilità ambientale non sia in opposizione ma anzi sempre di più allineata con la sostenibilità economica. Però chiaramente cioè, noi eh, dobbiamo saper fare ma abbiamo anche bisogno di far sapere. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're very right. We, we have a funny situation in Britain where we have sort of the, the leftish, the leftish newspapers, which are, you know, quite good on reporting climate change and things like that. But then you have papers on the on the other side, more like the Daily Mail. I don't know if you ever come across that, or the Daily Telegraph, or whatever, who have basically sort of been in the forefront of denying, but not not denying. But they have fantastic reach, and I have to say that they are probably doing more to, to make government aware of things like air pollution and of plastic pollution and things like that. Then I, uh, the point I'm making is that the media is, is sometimes failing uh, the uh, ordinary people. And one of the things we're not doing, I think, very much is we're not really investigating why some of these things are happening. So we're, 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 we're sort of scattergun approach and we find, you know, different individual parts of the, of, of, of the country doing wrong. But we're not looking at the systemic reasons why uh, consumption is, is just so polluting or uh, why the financial institutions are leading to climate change or whatever. So the, I think the media has got a huge number of questions to ask. But it's interesting that you, that you Sophie, that you, you think you, you, you must need to... Tell, tell me about your air pollution. You're working with air pollution. A lot of people don't understand that air pollution and climate change are quite linked. What, what would you say is the link and how are you trying to get through to people? Do you find it's easier to give the message of air pollution than the message of climate change? Grazie per la domanda. In effetti Anter quest'anno è diventata la prima associazione no profit italiana a raggiungere a, a diventare attore del, ehm, della coalizione per il clima e l'aria pulita, si chiama Climate and Clean Air Coalition, eh, che è un'emanazione delle Nazioni Unite in seguito alla COP21 di Parigi. E cosa significa eh, concentrarsi sulla tematica dell'aria? Significa due cose in particolare. 
Una è lottare appunto contro il cambiamento climatico e questo famoso eh, grado e mezzo che vorremmo eh, stabilizzare, come diceva giustamente il prestigioso collega. Ma è anche un'altra cosa, è cercare di informare la popolazione sul rischio non solo ambientale ma anche per la salute perché l'inquinamento atmosferico oggigiorno uccide, uccide eh, ora no, non ricordo perfettamente i dati dell'OMS, però uccide eh, ed è responsabile di molti tumori. A mente ricordo il 35% dei tumori al polmone viene dall'inquinamento atmosferico. Quindi interessarsi alle polveri sottili, che siano quelle esterne o quelle interne, è anche una questione di salute pubblica. Eh, I dati dell'OMS, per esempio, dicono che ritardi mentali ehm, accadono anche perché in gre nel grembo materno il feto viene eh, praticamente contaminato da queste polveri sottili che poiché hanno delle dimensioni nanometriche, riescano a entrare ovunque. No, ab absolutely. And the, and the more research which is done on air pollution, the more you realize it's, it's actually, uh, it's a part of almost every disease in, 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 in the developed world. And, uh, and the terrifying thing is that it's, it's now increasing so massively in, in, in poorer countries, developing countries. Um, and that we're exporting our, our sort of bad cars, bad diesels, bad ever to Africa, to uh, the countries which have really got no, no way of doing it. And also, I just don't think it's realized that 25% is some f fantastic figure, but it is, if you sorted out air pollution, you would sort out almost a quarter of most of the climate uh, gases as well. So there's a sort of, there's a, a symbiotic thing and, then, and I think governments are finding it easier to, uh, they really don't like being told about air pollution because it means they're going to have to do something. Uh, climate change has always, I think, has been in the future, one for the next government to do, one for the next uh, uh, prime minister or, or, or whoever. Um, and so it's been quite easy to say is something in the future. Air pollution is right here, right now, causing the effects of climate change which we are seeing. So I think, you know, we've all missed a trick here. For 20 years or, or 10 years, we've all been head in the sands about climate change. I mean, really, really worried about climate change and quite right, but we haven't looked at the things which are even closer to us. And I think that's a, a really important message which I'm getting now, which I didn't really understand before. So, uh, but, 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 but tell me, um, Zaturi, in, in, in the, 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 the FAO, What, uh, what is being done now which can really, which you think are, are you know, if you like, the future? Um, I'm, I'm increasingly persuaded that agroforestry is a, is, a, is a much better solution than to some of the large intensive farming, which are, and things like the system of rice intensification. In other words, there are many, many different ways to farm the land which are much more friendly uh, to the climate than, than the, the, the dominant systems which we have. Are you aware of these, these, if you like, new ideas which are coming through, and are you pushing them at a governmental level? Yes, we are aware of them and we are pushing them. Um, agriculture is um, a big contributor to um, greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, it is also vulnerable to the impact of climate change. And this is where we're trying to act. We're seeing agriculture as part of the problem, but also part of the solution. Um, we all know that climate change affects the poorest, the most, and the most vulnerable. Uh, and in the area of agriculture, is exactly the same. You know, small farmers, when there is a drought, when there is a, a flood, they are immediately affected. Sometimes they lose everything. And you can imagine the knock-on effects on their income, on their livelihoods, but also on their children's education, etc. cetera. Um, so we're aware of this, and this is what we're trying to, to act. One of our main agenda really is to tackle the issue of zero hunger. Uh, this is extremely important. As I mentioned earlier, we do have enough food, we do have enough technology, uh, but we need to find a better way of dealing with that issue. Now, final point on, 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 on agriculture 
is that if we look at the current trend of how global population is increasing, as we all know, and the fact that agriculture uses at least 70% of the fresh water available, so we cannot continue in the same way. So if we want to have sustainable agriculture, that means we have to change the way we produce food. We have to change the way we use food. We have to look at the land in a different way that we're using it now. Because food uses not just water, it uses energy, it uses fertilizers, etc. So the direction we're going is that Climate change forces the agriculture to change. You have to change the way that we produce food and, and we use it. So we have to be smart about how to produce agriculture, harnessing the power of technology. But in my opinion, the most challenging thing, and that comes back to what we discussed again this morning about education, is that getting the people and the farmers to adapt to this situation and see in the medium and long term and prepare for what's going to come, what is happening already and what's going to come. And on the point of education, I think it's easy this morning we're talking about educating people. That's fine. It's necessary. But there are many other people who didn't have a chance to be educated. So how do you communicate with them? There are many small farmers at the moment. There's many poor people who actually you know, rely on farming, for instance, taking the example of farming, but how do you go to them and tell them, do you know about climate change? There are people who worry about what they're going to eat just on a daily basis, and to come and present to them climate change, it's extremely challenging. You have to be really, you know, smart about it and present it in, in the right way. And just final point, I make since we're talking about health and air pollution, and take the example of um, women in particular in poor countries where they go and harvest the, you know, the wood and then do the cooking. They are exposed to air pollution, you know, black carbon in particular, and they're often having kids with them, small children. So it's a health issue, even though it's linked to climate change. But then if you present it as a health issue, you're likely to get a more response from policymakers in particular, but also from people to realize that this is not good for my health. I'd better do something about it. But uh, thank you very much. Is there not also a problem? You, you, you're talking about having to get smart about climate, uh, about agriculture and things. Uh, is that not just a code for very large multinational seed companies and others saying that they want a different sort of more intense agriculture? Uh, I mean, is it? Is it is the solution a technological one or is it one of, of habit or really of education? Well, the, the terminology, I mean, you, you can use any terminology you want. Um, I don't think sometimes we have to pay too much attention to what we call a certain effect or certain impact. The, the, the fact is that it's a reality and we have to do something about it, calling it agro uh, ecology or um, uh, climate smart agriculture. The fact is we're all in this. I think everyone has to do their bit, industry included, of course. You know, we're talking about the whole production cycle. You know, from the time you, 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 you plant the food to where it gets into us on our plates and, and consume it. And that's why I was talking about waste earlier and loss of food throughout the system as well. And this is the reality. I think people have to realize that we all have to do something. And, and we shouldn't really underestimate that sometimes something might appear to us a really small, but unless we do it and multiply it, then we're not going to get anywhere. I'll give you just final example, lighting for instance. We do waste a lot of electricity. You know, we know in our household, often especially those of us who have teenagers for instance, you know, we leave the light open every, um, on everywhere, um, appliances on, and we don't think actually about you know, the, really the impact of that, including to our bills, you know, how much money we pay for that. And that has to change. No, no, very good point. Miles, I can see you sort of hear the word teenagers and lights. Are you, how is your household? Are you, are you sort of committed to turning them off or uh, how does it work? Yeah. Yeah, no, actually, m my, my kids are pretty keen, actually. Um, but, uh, but, but that said, I, you know, I think, and, and, you know, obviously we can use the energy we've got at the moment 
far more eff effectively. The sort of colossal amounts we waste is, is tragic when you think about how that point that every ton we use now is a ton that the next generation won't have um, at its disposal. Um, Although I would just want to remind you of that the, the third dog in the in the fight there, um, you know, we've been talking about uh, air pollution and measures to reduce air pollution and and the, the the impact of agriculture and agroforestry and so on on emissions. These are all ways we can get emissions down in the short term, but they aren't going to address that second half of the century problem of how we can get the CO2 back out of the atmosphere. And is, I just, is this a technological? Have to keep, I have to keep reminding people that we're almost certainly going to have to do that and w that's what we're not thinking about at the moment what kind of technology are you are you thinking we're going to need is it sucking it out or is it geoengineering on a sort of space level or no i'm not talking about geoengineering the, the 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 planet the sort of mirrors in space idea i think that's that's out for geopolitical reasons more than any technical reasons um i don't think anybody would want um the president of the united states in control of our weather um, uh, particularly at the moment, um, but uh, uh, no. I, but but on the other hand, uh, the the ability to take CO two back out of the atmosphere, um, there are a number of ways of doing it. It's it's relatively simple chemistry. Um, plants do it, of course, all the time. But whether we want to rely on plants doing it for us, I I don't think we can make that. That would be a risk, um, unless we. Um, seriously change the way we, we use plants and possibly change the plants themselves. I think relying on biological measures to get the CO2 back out um, would be, would be uh, uh, risky. So I think we are probably ultimately talking about um, essentially engineering solutions where you're capturing CO2 directly from the atmosphere and re-injecting it underground. And that's going to take a lot of energy. It's, it's going to take, take a lot of money. It's going to take a huge amount of money. Who should pay for this? Well, I, I think that's the big question. This is where my, per and I should stress now, this is where my personal views on this uh, uh, come out. I, I think this is something that young people in the environmental movement in particular should be asking all the time. When you see these diagrams of emissions going below zero, the first thing you should ask is, who's going to pay for that? And because at the moment, the situation is just like the financial system in the 2000s, we have private capital today making a lot of money creating a long-term problem on the assumption that future taxpayers will clean it up. That, that's what's going on. So we have private profit, so, so we're, we're privatizing the profits, socializing the risk. And the presumption is at the moment that it'll be future taxpayers that will pay to take that CO2 back out of the atmosphere. And that, to me, is an outrage and something that I think young people should be much more upfront about in confronting the way the world is being run at the moment and asking the question, why is the fossil fuel industry, which by the way is back into profit, oil is $70 a barrel, they're doing very well, they're all reporting very high profits this year, why are they not investing at some fraction of that money on solving the problem, developing the technology, we, w the technologies we need to clean up their rubbish, the rubbish that there's being dumped in the atmosphere. We all talk about rubbish being dumped in the oceans as a problem, but CO2 dumped in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide dumped in the atmosphere, will be affecting the climate system for longer than the plastic we dump in the oceans. Miles, are you arguing that we need the fossil fuel industry? The fossil fuel industry would, if it had to, solve this problem overnight. This industry is worth $6 trillion a year. It's one-tenth of the world economy. If they had to solve the climate change problem, they would solve it. But nobody is even, uh, well, we, we ask them to. We ask them very nicely, and nothing happens. Zatuni, have you, have you ever posed that to the fossil fuel industry when they... Sorry, you get a big, big hand for there. Excellent. Have, have, have the fossil fuel in industry ever sort of made a démarche to you that they should uh, be responsible? Or how, how do you treat them? Uh, how, how do you treat them? Um, I think it, it comes back again to, to our demand, really, for, for energy and, and for resources. Um, the industry, um, I would say that you know, the industry is, is, is doing 
what it can. It's not enough, as, as, as I said earlier. There are also obviously economic um, interests in that. But you know climate change is about opportunities as well. So that it's okay for the private sector, which what they care about is making profit, that's fine. But now we're talking about sustainability revolution and everyone has to realize that's the way we're going to go ahead, we can't just keep doing the same thing, business as usual, as we say, and everyone has to get that message. Now, obviously, not everyone is getting it yet, but, and that's the sad story, because even though we see impacts, you know, day by day, you know, with the floods and droughts and hurricanes, etc., as a human being, we tend to react only when there is a tragedy, when something really happens and affects us, then we do something about it. We see it in, you know, at, at traffic policies and other things. It's really common. But I think coming back to, to the industry, again, it's our role really to convince them that, you know, the way forward is we only have one planet. We have limited resources. The population is growing very fast. And then, you know, we can't possibly carry on like this. And I think there are things happening. The last point I make is we shouldn't really expect in the industry who holds the solution or the government who hold the solutions. You know, if we just sit here and think, and I think this is where the problem is of climate change in a sense, because we think that... You know, governments and international negotiations, and they're taking care of this. And I think most people, ordinary public people, thinking that's the fact. It's not. We all have to be involved. You know, if you think that that's going to be taken care of, you're wrong. You have to do your bit as well. That's what I was saying, and you referred to behavior. In my opinion, that's the most challenging thing, because we can still see that most people, they are not just willing to compromise and change the way they live. Just look at the way we drive, for instance. There's so many people who still take their cars for such a short distance. You really can just walk or cycle. You do not need to drive for like you know, a kilometer or a mile. That's where you end up with traffic. Um, congestion, air pollution, and other things. These are basic things, but we do not think about them. We think climate change is for government, is for UN organi organizations to sort out, is for everyone. So, so you know, get real and take action yourself as well. Sophie, this is your message, isn't it? It's the people, power, power to the people. They, they should decide, should they? Or? Sì, ovviamente sì, ha perfettamente ragione il collega. Eh, eh, è indicativo che nelle lingue quando si parla di ehm, azioni da svolgere spesso si usa l'impersonale, dovrebbero fare e cosa fanno i governi e cosa fanno le istituzioni, è sempre la responsabilità di qualcun altro, invece no, è la responsabilità di noi tutti. Abbiamo ogni giorno la possibilità di scegliere, eh, di scegliere per esempio di andare a piedi, in bicicletta, di scegliere eh, di ehm, eh, non so, eh, mettere le, il riscaldamento eh, nelle, ne, nelle nostre case due o tre gradi in meno e magari con una, una maglia in più eh, facciamo qualcosa anche noi per il pianeta. Abbiamo la possibilità eh, per esempio di evitare ai nostri figli eh, domani di essere esposti eh, appunto all'inquinamento piuttosto che eh, svolgere anche noi attività di divulgazione e di educazione insomma è l'affare di tutti noi non è una questione che riguarda un governo piuttosto che eh, un'istituzione un io mh, vorrei ribadire che eh, ehm, come dicevano anche i miei prestigiosi colleghi, in questo momento abbiamo eh, un'urgenza e dobbiamo lottare eh, per garantire la, sosteni la sostenibilità ambientale e il diritto alla salute a tutti, anche ai più poveri, anche chi non ha la possibilità di essere informato e essere educato. Quindi, eh, lo potete fare voi che siete nelle università o con i vostri amici utilizzando i social, cioè tutti noi lo possiamo fare, quindi questo sarà eh, diciamo il mio appello oggi. Well ok, that's the challenge, how many people here are not prepared to do anything? <laughs> how many are going to do something?
Okay, not all of you. That's interesting. And how many are all? How many of you think that you are already doing something? Ah, it's not bad. Not bad. Okay, there's some hope for us now. The, 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 now it's your turn. We want you, please, ask these guys the questions. They they admit that they don't have the answers. <laughs> so, so give them a hard time, or praise them, or, or whatever you like. But please, please, let's all interact now. Um, and uh, we've got 15, 20 minutes, so we can uh, really nail down Mr. Allen and his uh, geoengineering or not, and, uh, and and everybody. Let's have some questions. Anyone, anyone with burning to say anything at all? Anyone? Yes, there's one at the back, waving, waving a hand. Hi, good morning. I'm Matteo Mura from the University of Bologna. Uh, I try to teach students how to embed sustainability in organizations. Uh, actually, uh, the IPCC for the last 30 years has done a brilliant, uh, incredible job in synthesizing the knowledge coming from uh, physical sciences and hard sciences uh, and provide actions uh, for solving climate issues. Um, starting from right from the beginning of this morning, the chair of the IPCC said that actually these actions have to be implemented uh, in societies and uh, implemented by organizations and implemented by individuals. Uh, so this comes to basically integrating social sciences with uh, uh, hard sciences. Uh, how do you see this integration in the future in order to implement uh, these actions that uh, the IPCC has suggested in their reports? So embedding social sciences with the outcome of uh, hard sciences. Thanks. I think that's one for you, Miles. Well, actually, I... I moved, partly moved, from a physics department to a geography department recently uh, pr for precisely that reason. I think I recognize that the big challenge now is, as you say, not really the, the physical understanding of the climate system, but understanding the, the human system responses to it. And, and this gives me an excuse to come back to the question of how the problem is framed. Social scientists love talking about framing. I'm learning that, that this is a, a very important word for social scientists. And, and how the problem is framed is critical to the way people are responding to it and also to the way we are failing to deal with it. So if I could push back um, on some of these, the, the, the discussion earlier about, you know, we shouldn't say it's the fossil fuel industry's fault, it's there. I, I, I think that's a good point. It's not a they, but we are all part of the fossil fuel industry because we are its customers. If we, 20 years ago, had thought of this problem as a waste disposal problem, not as a social, a societal, behavioral problem, where would we be now? So we use the atmosphere as a waste dump for our carbon dioxide. Very few other industries are allowed to dispose of their waste just by dumping them in the atmosphere. If we raise that question at the beginning to think of this as a waste disposal problem and aimed to make it eventually an obligation on the industry, if they're selling a product, they should clear up the waste that, that it causes, then we would all today be spending more than we do on fossil fuels. They would have become more expensive because we would all already be paying for carbon dioxide removal, but we would be well on our way to solving the climate change problem. And I would argue that we have to ask you know, whether that's a that different way of framing the problem, and it, you know, it's not geoengineering, it's just waste disposal. Whether we need to think of reframing the problem in that way is a way of perhaps moving forward faster than we're doing at the moment. Because by just focusing on behavior, on consumer action, it, it's not working. Sophie first, do you, want, do you want to come back quickly on that? Very good point. 
No, penso che eh, appunto Marsa abbia detto esattamente tutto quello, molto meglio anche di quanto avrei potuto farlo. Semplicemente eh, così come esistono in altri campi eh, un'interazione tra le scienze dure e le scienze sociali, a volte si può misurare anche in termini di cause e conseguenze. Si parlava oggi eh, delle, dei, dei, delle risorse che delle popolazioni si devono contendere talvolta e questa è una delle conseguenze. Insomma, ci sono vari modi e a volte la ricerca deve anche ehm, cercare di porsi il problema, appunto come diceva eh, il collega, sotto altri angoli, perché non sempre l'approccio tradizionale può funzionare. Very good, very good point. Thank you, thank you, Sophie. You, uh, first of all, have we got any more burning questions? Okay, there is another one up in the... Who can get a microphone up? First of all, there's one there. Whoever's first with the mic. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much for the interventions made. They were really interesting. But I do have three questions, if possible. <laughs> Keep them very, very short. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is that it really goes in inspiration from the Syrian question that you've asked. Because can a regional conflict, it can be sort of a disparity because of climate change. And speaking of this, also touching upon what Mr. Allen said is that the fact that, uh, that uh, a collective action is needed. But sometimes when we think about it from the abroad, the global north, they have a much more permeability in order to use these sophisticated technologies to get or to get the removal of the CO2 than the global south. So this is, so my question is, what about the disparity and what about the different grievances that we see between states? although we need this collective action. The second one is that what Mr. Ulidada has mentioned about, we shouldn't be really reliant on governments, but at the same time is that when we look at the private sector, they're only looking for profit. So where does this leave us as citizens of different countries? Do we rely on, if we cannot rely on the government and we can't rely on the private sector, what is sort of the medium that we can circumvent around? And the third and final question, which is more of a millennial question, because someone, I think Mr. Oledada has mentioned about the agricultural revolution and about the food and food consumption. Um, there's this aggravating question about, is veganism diet is the right way in order to help with, uh, with any, with in order to uh, deter any uh, repercussions of climate change? Thank you. Okay, well, three huge questions. <laughs> but thank you for keeping yeah. them short. Okay, so we're, we, we're gonna wrap up quite quickly, I'm told. So um, any other questions, let's take them now and then we'll lob them back at the Okay, one in the, in the aisle here, please. And anyone else, now, now's your only chance or last chance. Don't all put your hands up at once. Oh, there's one over here as well, there's another one. Oh my God, we're going to be here for hours, I can see. <laughs> can I speak? Yes, my name is Renzo Tavone. I have uh, worked uh, all my life uh, in the nuclear field at, at Trenea in Italy. And uh, uh, what uh, is disappointing is uh, to see that uh, uh, most uh, of the campaign of uh, um, suggesting uh, the use of uh, renewables uh, are accompanied by the uh, disappointing part of refusing nuclear as uh, a devil, as, as a thing that is very bad. But from my point of view, renewable and the nuclear should be uh, a companion in, uh, in the, uh, uh, in avoiding the CO2 produ production. And, uh, 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 but uh, if we look at Germany that uh, had uh, decided to stop uh, the, the nuclear plant before the end of life, that is uh, something uh, crazy because uh, 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 Nuclear uh, plants are very costly as uh, uh, installing them, uh, but uh, they recover the, the, the many with uh, a, a, a life uh, uh, um, themselves. So Germany preferred uh, to stop nuclear and to continue 
to have uh, coal plant uh, functioning. Well, that's a big conundrum. Leave, 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 leave it right there. That's my question. Because, uh, well, we'll definitely come on to that. Any other questions? We, we have to wrap them up. There's one, one here, mm -hmm. gentlemen, and then some of you are going to be disappointed. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, you have all said you're quite optimistic about meeting the 1.5 target. I was just wondering if, in order to achieve that target, we would need to convince even the, the least adapting companies to, to car decarbonize their supply chains. So like Monsanto or Coca-Cola, would it involve even their supply chains being de decarbonized in the near term? Like okay, okay, right. I'm going to, I'm going to lob all... Oh, hang on. Is there one more? There is. Yeah, I mean, it's a fast one. Go on, go, go, go. And it's really related to what the girls just said before. I mean, I I'm speaking as a, let's say, future taxpayers, and I'm, you know that there will be the election next week in Italy, and nobody is posing climate change as priority outcome of, let's say, the political view of the next five years. So to whom should I pose this question? <laughs> Good question. Well, now, this is ridiculous because we could be here for another four hours and I would love to be. Um, and maybe we can continue it in a different way. But let, let's, we, we've had huge questions about capitalism and, and, and developing countries, about veganism, about nuclear power. We've had and, and, and elections in. Who can, who can answer any of these questions? Please, panel, are you, over to you. You're the only people left who can answer it now. I, I can kick off with the nuclear one. Um, I think uh, the nuclear industry um, has, has to sort out, it's had to sort out its waste disposal problem. We can argue about whether the nuclear industry has succeeded in sorting out its waste disposal problem. But crucially, the comparison of nuclear with coal is completely unfair because we have to dispose of nuclear waste and yet the key waste from burning coal, the CO2, we just dump in the atmosphere. So. If you had a level playing field and both industries were required to dispose of their own waste, then you would actually be able to make much more rational decisions about which one to use. And that's the comparison we should be making. That should have been the comparison that was made in Germany. And I think it's a, one of the tragedies of European climate policy is the speed with which we decided to move out uh, of, of nuclear uh, energy without thinking through the, the alternatives. So, so that's, a, 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 again, it comes back to the fact that we have an industry that is dumping its waste into the atmosphere and relying on future taxpayers uh, to, to clean it up. Um, we could be, uh, so, so if, uh, on, on the um, diet, and can I just pick up on that one as well? I'm sure we'll have more on that one. Um, but absolutely, there, is, there are opportunities there um, for, uh, for, for massively reducing emissions through changing diet. Um, my guess would be that by the time many of the people in this room reach retirement age, um, many of our present ways of producing um, food, such as growing cows and then grinding them up to make burgers, will look very quaint and, and bizarre. Um, I, I recently had a, a super burger, which was made entirely of some yeast um, extract, which tastes, and it bled just like a beef burger. It was really impressive, and it tasted really good. Um, and I wonder in 50 years' time whether we'll bother to, to, to use cows to make burgers anymore. Um, so, so I think, you know, there's, there's a lot changing there, and there's a huge opportunity. On the north-south question, finally, on this, you know, I talk about CO2 disposal, um, isn't that imposing a, a new cost on the global south? And I am very sensitive to that, to, to, to that question, and I think you're absolutely right to raise it. Um, obviously, the countries with the highest cumulative emissions to date, and it's worth emphasizing because Britain likes to emphasize how good we are at reducing our emissions, but because on the only metric that matters, which is the total amount of carbon you've dumped in the atmosphere over all of history, Britain, because we started emitting CO2 before anybody else, is actually the world's worst polluter. We don't like to talk about that, I know, and I know you're no longer with the British government, but I can't resist pointing it out. Um, so, so we have, obviously, the immediate responsibility to develop these technologies for CO2 disposal. It would be ridiculous to ask Nigeria 
to start doing carbon dioxide disposal before Europe does. But at the moment, not even Europe, which claims to be progressive on climate, is doing this. Nobody's doing it. Nobody's even talking about it. Nobody's even working out how we're going to pay to do it. That's the huge elephant in the corner, the huge gap in the conversation about climate change at the moment. And we have to address that because, you know, to quote Arnold Schwarzenegger, who said a lot of good things about climate change, but one thing he said was somehow, somewhere, someone's going to pay. I believe he wasn't talking about climate change at the time, but, uh, but, but it's a quote worth remembering. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to pay. The only real question is whether it's the present generation that's dumping CO2 in the atmosphere or the next generation that will have to clean it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Trini, so many questions, how many answers? I'm just going to answer two very briefly. The first one on disparity, let's uh, ask my, the lady there. I'll just make one clarification. Um, in my statement, I think you missed the word only. What I meant is not to rely only on government and other organizations. We all have to do our bit. So please don't misunderstand that. Um, on disparity issue, um, technology in particular, I think we shouldn't forget that um, we don't need to talk only about big technologies. In some countries, there is just very small, adaptive, local technology that can make a huge difference to people's lives. Take the example of um, cook stoves, for instance. You just need something very simple that can be efficient at burning wood, and it produces less smoke, and, and is very beneficial. So technology of the north, of the south, I think it can be mis misleading. And if you take the example of renewable energy, uh, almost every country in the world now has a policy on renewable energy. And developing countries actually are investing more on renewable energy than developed nations. In fact, I think if I remember well, um, between 2005 and 2015, developing countries invested something like 17 times more in 2015 than 2005, and in a period of 10 years, basically. So, you know, I think we have to take that into consideration. And now also, there is a big trend of South-South exchange, South-South cooperation. A lot of countries in the South trying to understand that actually they have a lot of things in common in terms of challenges and culture and language and other things that it makes sense for them to address things together. So I think disparity, it is happening, but you have to understand it in a context that is not really across the board and that there are differences. And my um, last comment very briefly on the vegan uh, question, that's an important one. I think we have to be realistic. There is no way that everyone is going to become vegan, okay? So even though we think it's a solution, it's part of the solution. I wouldn't say that we have to tell everyone, stop eating meat and then climate change will be resolved. Of course not. Because there are other issues, as I was saying earlier, across the whole food chain. For example, we have to um, waste less. We have to eat properly. We all know we need a balanced diet, and sometimes it includes meat. Uh, maybe sometimes you don't have to eat meat every day if you think that helps. But you have to be sensible and think about the whole chain and what you can do about it. And this is where it brings in not just citizens, us, but other actors as well. And that, I think, I responded to the first question also about where does it leave citizens. Well, citizens actually are the most concerned because everything that governments do, industry, uh, UN agencies, academia, others, at the end of the day, is for people. Everything we do is about people. IPCC, everybody else. When you think about it, when you take a step away, everything we do is for us, for people. And it's really important. It's, I'm glad that the, the gentleman there said, you know, the integration of social sciences. And that's a huge gap because even in governments, in other organizations, even though we're dealing with people, you don't have social experts there. So you have the scientists, you have the policy makers, you have the physicists, you have you know, all the experts. You rarely find actually someone who says, you know, I'm a social scientist. I know actually about people's behavior and how to communicate with them. And that's really missing. So I'm glad that the gentleman there 
uh, you know, talk about the integration. That should be across the board. You know, every organization should really have social scientists. Stop there, because we have got a social scientist in the room. Yeah. Sophie, take it away. You're the, 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 the last word on this enormous, huge, vast subject. What can we say in Italian, in French, in German, in English, in any well, language in you like? <laughs> How can we do it? What, what do we do? Um, no, vorrei tornare solo un attimo sulla domanda riguarda alle prossime elezioni che si svolgeranno in Italia e parlo da non italiana. Eh, noi ci siamo interessati ai programmi ambientali dei partiti. I programmi per l'ambiente praticamente non esistono. La domanda è perché l'ambiente non interessa o perché il diciamo la politica pensa che non sia prioritario per il cittadino forse la politica oggi pensa che l'ambiente poiché non si vede non si sente perché certo c'è un'urgenza ma non si percepisce perché ci è così affine che non la vediamo più è un po la storia della lettera smarita di edgar Allan Poe, ce l'abbiamo sotto agli occhi e non la vediamo e allora si torna a quello che diceva eh, Udada, <ride> eh, e cioè che tocca al cittadino far sentire la propria voce, perché il partito, qualsiasi partito, la politica, lavora a servizio del cittadino. Se il cittadino ha delle necessità, le deve far sapere e quindi si torna alla responsabilità di ognuno di noi. Questo forse è la cosa eh, che ci dobbiamo ricordare, anche perché i sondaggi ci dicono che oggi l'Italia si disinteressa della propria politica. La maggior parte degli italiani non sa neanche cosa andrà a votare fra, fra qualche giorno. I sondaggi sono al momento abbastanza difficili da, da leggere. Si torna alla responsabilità di ognuno di noi. Se vogliamo che le cose cambino, ci dobbiamo rimboccare le, mani, le maniche. Very, very, very well said. Miles, I'm going to do a bit of mini, or maybe a teeny weeny, ten words. Um, I, I, I was hearing from somebody recently, people who believe in climate change don't vote and the people who vote don't believe in climate change. That was a statement about the US, but it also a statement about the UK, and it's a really important point. Um, if young people got out and voted in the same way that they believe in, in climate change, we'd see a very different priority on this issue, I'm sure. No, well said, and thank you for saying it quite clearly. No, I mean, we're in an era of new politics now, and this is going to be the base of it, things like climate change and food and how do we live, and cities and urbanization, these are going to be the problems which exercise us all over the next 20 years. I'm old enough to have seen the IPCC, IP, how many C's, start, uh, and it was a tiny bunch of, of sort of slightly mad scientists who you felt who were doing it in their back rooms and doing it, they were volunteering. It was a very, very small operation, and it's grown in stature and it's grown in uh, importance over the last 20, 30 years. It's brilliant to hear how it's going to change over the next 10 years and involve all these different questions which are so important. The danger, of course, is that um, climate change is too important for the scientists. Th I think what the IPC is showing is that, that, uh, is that uh, the science is absolutely fundamental to how we live today. Thank you for being a brilliant, brilliant audience and for being an excellent panel. Thank you so much indeed. Goodbye.